yeah. Joyce. I was ready to six six. All right. <laughs> Our next speaker this afternoon, I'm very happy to welcome, is Peter Chadney. Peter Chadney is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wuppertal in Germany and a leading specialist of the work of Martin Heidegger. He's the editor of seven, I believe, seven volumes of Heidegger's Gesamtausgabe, uh, most recently the volumes of the Black Notebooks. Peter Chadney is the author of numerous books in German on Heidegger, many of which have been translated into English including, most recently, Heidegger and the Myth of a Jewish World Conspiracy from Chicago, and the forthcoming Heidegger Critical Introduction coming out from Polity this coming January. Peter Chaffney is also the co-editor of a recent volume that I've been lucky enough to see, uh, Heidegger's Black Notebooks, Responses to Antisemitism, published in Columbia. I'm very pleased to welcome him to the podium now to speak on our language, German philosophy, from Fichte to Heidegger. Please welcome Peter Chaffney. First, I, I have to thank very much Katie and Rodrigo and Kelly for their efforts and their work for the or uh, even the catering. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. And the second point is that I am apparently a German. Thus, my language is not yours, so it is not the English. So forgive me for torturing your language. The second thing is that because of the many papers I heard, I wrote a lot with my own hand. So I have a lot of handwriting here. And it can be that I cannot read my own handwriting. So maybe I will stop a couple of times and interrupt my 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 uh, my paper. So our our language, uh, German philosophy from from Fichte to Heidegger. Actually, I wanted <clears throat> to change my title, or I uh, left. I, I wanted to let to leave this Heideggerian expression, our language, this quotation and just to speak about uh, German philosophy. But now I think I, I should start with it by referring to its ambiguity. Uh, separate from the Heideggerian context, our language does not show who is the subject of this collective, of this gathering in the we. As you know, the Trako text is, is a lecture. It's not an essay, it's actually a, a lecture. So, when Heidegger said, uh, our language, we could ask um, who was listening. Um, were there foreigners in the room, for instance? Um, so, one of this possibility of this we is that that, it is a that this gathering is an exclusive, excluding community, for instance, like a, like a nation state. Or it can be the inclusive, including community of the cosmos, the cosmopolis. So, do we have language in the sense often or only of an idiomatic and even idiotic self-assertion? Or do we have it as an absolute discourse, as an absolute possibility of self-interpretation or self-understanding? Or is language both <coughs> finite and infinite? <coughs> Individual and absolute. I could also ask, is there an absolute translation? An eschatology of translation 
and always already translated eschatology. In this sense, I want to introduce the change in the title of my paper, not to speak of our language. I, I remember the Davos conversation uh, between Kassira and, and Heidegger. And at the end of this dialogue, conversation, um, Kassira comes to the to the, how, what he calls the Urphenomen Sprache, the Arch Phenomenon language. And then he says, I, I quote him in, in my translation from the German into the English, everybody speaks his language, and it is unthinkable that the language of the one is transferred, übertragen, in the language of the other. And nevertheless, we understand us by the medium of language. There is something like the language, and something like a, an unity above the infinity of the diverse modes of speaking. Heidegger contradicted, as you know, and he said, mere mediation will never bring a productive progress. And then he emphasizes finiteness, and particularly the finiteness of roundness. I will come to, to this concept of roundness. Kassira, the scientist, the Neo-Kantian, the Platonist, the Jew, demands for an absolute language. Heidegger, the thinker, the German, demands for a decision, <clears throat> for a decision in thrownness. In my paper, this constellation will, will reappear with a, with, a different, with a different representative. To begin with the beginning, since my time as a student of philosophy, of continental philosophy, to be more precise, but also as a student of the history of art since this beginning until today, the beginning of philosophy or art and its study is unavoidably connected with the Greeks. The Greeks, at first it just seems to be a façon de parler. The Greeks are in fact, of course, the ancient Greeks. And then, if we speak out this name, this code, this shibboleth, perhaps, the Greeks, we do not think of all ancient Greeks, but only of a few, a dozen, maybe two dozen. We are thinking not only of philosophers, but also of poets and sculptures and writers and even gods. Wasn't Dionysos a Greek? These are the Greeks, which are so incredibly important, because with them started what still, still, still is called philosophy. Nevertheless, or after all, we speak of the Greeks as if there was a certain people at a certain time and at a certain place. Heidegger says it himself in the contributions to philosophy. He says, philosophy as philosophy of a people. Who would deny that philosophy, that philosophy is this? And do we not have witness for this, which beats every opinion against it? The great beginning of Western philosophy, Abendlandisch. Is it not the philosophy of the Greek people? Thus the certain, uh, thus the, the origin of philosophy is inscribed in the history or in the story of a certain people at a certain time and place. Perhaps if we, without further ado, speak of the Greeks, we are thinking, more or less, that there was an ethnos and a topos, a collective, a collecting and gathering around a pole, a polis, where philosophy emerged. And I remember, I recall, that already Plato is performing this gathering when he lets an Egyptian say, 
O Solon, Solon, Helenes Ai, Paides Este, Geron de Helen, Uc Este. O Solon, Solon, you Greeks are always children, there is no old Greek. The member of an, of an even older gathering than the Greeks and Egyptians emphasizes the talent for philosophy. So children are always astonished, always asking. These are already Plato's Greeks, and we believed him until today. Perhaps we are willing to accept that we cannot accept it in the perspectives of destruction or deconstruction. When we used to say, for instance, for the Greeks there is no positive meaning of infinity, or for the Greeks there is no eschatology in history, or for the Greeks there is no creating God. These phrases are not only highly problematic because we could always find a text or a fragment which sounds differently. These phrases are particularly problematic because we call for a collective subject, for a collection or a gathering where certain thoughts and ideas were more than theoretical remarks of marginal intellectuals, where philosophy was something of a people, where philosophy and poetry was the vox populi. But at the same time, when we speak of the Greeks as if there would be such a subject in time and place, we confirm that what has been Greek for the, is still, for the Greeks is still present everywhere, or at least there where one calls for the Greeks. Might this be in the USA, in China, or in Brazil? This is not only because Greek philosophy shapes certain problems which are still actual, take the actuality of the Aristotelian organon in logics, but because the language of philosophy and poetry is still for a huge part Greek. Still students of philosophy should, should know what ontology, metaphysics, ethics, theory, tragedy, anthropology, cybernetics, technology, and even maybe problema itself means. This also counts, of course, for the Latin. I could, all, I could also have spoken of the Romans and this very place, Rome. That means the Greeks are not only a people at a certain time and place. We are referring to the Greeks as if they would be a universal people, the founder of a universal or cosmopolitical discourse, a still actual discourse beyond a certain time and a certain place. At least, we are using the shibboleth, the Greeks, like this, as if there would be a universal or cosmopolitical discourse, which at the same time is the discourse of a people. We are using it like this means that there seems to be no problem to say the Greeks is both a reference to a people at a certain time and place and an introduction to universal or cosmopolitical discourse. In Derrida's reading of Heidegger, we see how Derrida, English, five, three. How Derrida discovers in Heidegger's text something <coughs> what he calls le geste fichtéen. He discovers Heidegger's gathering logos, Heidegger's logos of the Germans, the Deutschen, or the German, das Deutsche. Derrida discovers this in the context of the Geschlecht of this mere uh, non-translatability. Uh, of course, Derrida knows that the matrix, the matrix of Heidegger's discourse about the Germans indicates a problem referring to Heidegger's understanding of politics, or what we can today, after the publication of the Black Notebooks, call Heidegger's understanding of metapolitics, metapolitics of the historical people, to be more precise. And the historical people is, of course, are, of course, the Germans. Here in Geschlecht 3, it is mostly the 11th session where Derrida approaches what he calls a philosophical nationalism and in another text in French, national-philosophisme uh, national allemand. He sees the political dimension of this discourse and therefore he sees Heidegger's entanglement in national socialism because of this project to establish a German philosophy, to establish the Germans as a necessary addition to the Greeks. Derrida speaks of an, I quote, paradoxical but regular association of nationalism with cosmopolitanism and humanism. This seems to refer to our use of the code of the Greeks. There seems to be no problem in using this code as ambivalent in the sense of a memory of a very particular people and of a universal 
and cosmopolitical, cosmopolitical discourse. Even if the Greeks never were interested to propagate their thinking or culture, even if the Greeks actually never existed as a political body, the narrative of the Greeks succeeded worldwide. So maybe not, not even, but because then it is. But, well. Or to say more philosophical, what on the, on the one hand looks like a historical finite and limited phenomenon, an event at a certain time and place, delivers on the other hand an infinite sequence of thoughts and ideas including the problem of the relation between finiteness and infinity in itself, uh, as the discussion of the Apeiron, uh, for instance. And I cannot ignore that at this point of my uh, thoughts, one could remember Alain Badiou's book about St. Paul and the origin of universalism. But the devil is in the detail. Fichte is not Heidegger, <coughs> and the Germans are not the Greeks. The difference between Fichte and Heidegger is not unimportant, and the regularity of an identity of nationalism and universalism has for Heidegger finally a signifi signification Derrida could not know exactly. In his important preface to Geschlecht III, Rodrigo Tereso refers to Fichte's speeches of the German nation. I want to deal with another text of Fichte, written one year earlier than the famous and quite popular speeches. It is a text with the title, in German, Der Patriotismus und sein Gegenteil, Patriotische Dialogen vom Jahre 1807, The Patriotism and its Counterpart, Patriotic Dialogues from 1807. And you know that this date, 1807, indicates a very interesting time for Germany in general. One year ago, in October 1806, the Battle of Jena and Auerstadt took place. Napoleon and his army defeated the Prussian army and became the central power in Europe. This was the time when Prussia found the way to radical innovations, most of all in the sector of education. Maybe it is unique in world history that philosophy became the main source for a new foundation of a university system, what was called actually until the post-World War II time Humboldt University, in reference to Wilhelm von Humboldt, who on the fundament of Kant's philosophy proposed a new understanding of science. Never again, and never before, philosophy, and with this the philosophies of this time, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, etc., had this importance for the institutions of education. I remember only the lectures on the method of academic study from 1803, a little bit earlier, by Schelling, or the deduction of a plan for a higher institution of learning to be established in Berlin, 1807, by Fichte, and Schelling again on the essence of German science from 1807. And is it by accident <coughs> that Hegel in 1807 finished his phenomenology of the spirit? <coughs> and as a spontaneous evocation, what is German idealism? Do we not have here the same paradox Derrida is speaking of? Can there be a German matrix of idealism? Or is this title a result of the same ambivalent craving for universal topos? An idiotic idiom desiring absoluteness? Back to Fichte's dialogue. The quite, this quite ironic text Remember that we are also moving in these days of uh, German Romanticism, these days of the Schlegels and Novalis. This dialogue between two different types of patriots and patriotism argues for, I could say, with Fichte, a cosmo cosmopolitical patriotism. Fichte writes, Cosmopolitism is the dominating will that the purpose of the Dasein des Menschengeschlechtes im Menschengeschlecht actually is fulfilled. Patriotism is the will that this purpose was at first fulfilled in this very nation whose members we are ourselves, and that from this nation the success spreads about the whole Geschlecht. Here we have all ingredients of the paradox. Cosmo cosmopolitanism is nationalism because this very nation has the patriotic will to fulfill the cosmopolitical purpose. 
The identity of cosmopolitanism and nationalism is a teleological one. Fichte defines the nation of this nationalism as we ourselves. This we is not each we ourselves of every nation, but the Germans. Fichte continues, the separation of the Germans from the remaining European nations is established, begründet, by nature. Through common language and through a common national character, which unifies the Germans mutually, they are separated from the other European nations. By nature means here, obviously, the separation happens by itself. Language is nothing what a people produces by itself. By, but what about the common uh, national character? Wasn't Germany and in many small and small states divided country? Was it, let us say, or let me say, the difference between Prussia and Bavaria not so deep that even in my own, own childhood, we, or yeah, we more or less coming from a Prussian area, were in Bavaria called Prussian souls, Saupreußen. Uh, the other non-cosmopolitical patriot argues, therefore, for a in this dialogue, uh, argue, argues, uh, therefore, for a Prussian patriotism, while the other, and it is, it is very probably Fichte himself, criticizes. But language and national character are apparently only the necessary but not the sufficient condition for a European or even universal hegemony of the Germans. Fichte explains, the German patriot particularly has the will that this purpose, the, ne the very next purpose of the Menschengeschlecht, is at first realized by the Germans, and that from them the success will be spread about the remaining humanity, Menschheit. The German can have this will, because we, with him science has begun, and in his language this, it is uh, documented. Thus science and language are the indicator for the German hegemony. I already recall the historical situation in Germany, Prussia, at the beginning of the 19th century. Never again intellectuals, philosophers, had so much influence on institutionalizing a new form of university, and in this sense, Fichte could emphasize the importance of science, i.e., of course, of his own doctrine of science, i.e., of philosophy. Prussia mobilized not only soldiers in arms, but also soldiers of the spirit. But to be clear, Fichte himself did not understand in the situation only like this, um, as if there would be a pre-established task of the Germans. He argues in the framework of his philosophy of history. Ra rather, he speaks of a dark instinct of reason from whom everything arises, what is re relevant for the human race, for the mensch menschlichen Geschlecht. This instinct, instinct of reason incorporated itself in a few chosen ones, weniger auserwählte, an instinct he simply also can call genius, coming from, uh, from, from Kant, probably. But this time of the genius came to its end. Fichte and his contemporaries are living in times of science, and because the Germans are the people of this science, it is privileged. The Germans are privileged. They know the cosmopolitical task of this science. Therefore, and this is a move one could also find in Heidegger, uh, Fichte declares that only the German is a patriot. So that's, that's actually, yeah, that, that sounds like Heidegger. Only a German can be a patriot. Only he or she can think, or more, more he, he can think and understand that the purpose of his nation is in itself the purpose of the whole humanity. So Fichte also calls the Germans an arch people, Urvolk. For the other European nations, there is only a possibility for a non-scientific patriotism, which is actually egoism. The patriotism of the other European nations is necessarily, says Fichte, selfishly, narrow-hearted, engherzig, and hostile to the other Menschengeschlecht. After all, we hear Fichte saying, if not the German takes over through science the government of the world, non-European nations, the North American tribes, for the price of many vexations will take over, 
and bring the form of being Wesen to its end. Well, I actually do not know of what North American tribes Fichte thinks here. <coughs> Mais ce qui compte, peut-être par-dessus tout, c'est d'avoir quitté le lieu. Pour une heure, un homme a existé en dehors de tout horizon. Tout était ciel autour de lui, ou plus exactement, tout était espace géométrique. Un homme existait dans l'absolu de l'espace homogène. This very famous phrase, phrases by Emmanuel Levinas, emphasize the huge difference to Heidegger. He is the thinker of the place, Heidegger, of the historical features of the place, of what it means to live in a land, in a homeland. By the way, David speaks about this, uh, about the importance of, of, of the land. But apropos to, on the way to language, in uh, this book where you know that the tracker text uh, was published, um, the German word land is not only present in Trakert's poems or in, in, in Trakert's uh, context, but even more in Stefan Georges The Word. I just uh, um, quote this in German. Wunder von Ferne oder Traum brachte ich an meines Landes Saum. And it's very interesting what Heidegger says about land in the, in the interpretation of that, of that poem. And I would, I would go for an esoteric um, because he doesn't, he, he doesn't speak about the Germans, but he is an esoteric dimension in these texts, an esoteric nationalist uh, in this sense, in the, in the Heideggerian sense, a dimension. Levinas sees and feels the problems in this celebration of the place. His Gagarin remark, so it was a quotation of Heidegger Gagarin, uh, uh, his Gagarin remark, that one human being existed in the absolute of the homogeneous space for one hour. Um, this Gagarin remark is the necessary emphasis of the cosmopolitical or universal character of philosophy, philosophy as ethics. But how would Heidegger have responded to this remark? I quote Heidegger. One of the most concealed forms of the gigantic, and perhaps the oldest, is a tenacious facility in calculating, manipulating, and interfering. Through this facility, the worldlessness of Judaism receives its ground. We know that this is a passage from the Black Notebooks from the so-called Ponderings 8. The worldlessness, Heidegger thinks of here, is not the worldlessness of the stone, what some critics of Heidegger were insinuating, it is without a doubt the worldlessness of the universal matrix of technology, the universal matrix of every possible spaceship. What does the confrontation of Levinas and Heidegger's remark mean? What is this confrontation? It is a distortion and interruption, a rupture in the rhythm and the speed of my presentation. So where am I now? Fichte explained how every true cosmopolitanism or universalism must be a German patriotism, and he also claimed that there is only one patriotism, namely the German. We see the circle in this argument. Like for Heidegger, for Fichte, this circle was obviously not a circulus viciosus, but a circle in the thing itself. It is now questioned, and Derrida says it, that this thought cannot be found in Heidegger in this way, that this is not even a possible, a possible this Fichte's thought, Fichtean thought is not even a possible Heideggerian thought. He understands every cosmopolitanism or universalism as a fruitless heritage of metaphysics, Heidegger. For him, the only possible universalism is one of, uh, of mathematics and technology, i.e. of modern science. This universalism is not a neutral, this Heideggerian Universalism is not a neutral method, not a neutral way of thinking at all. Or let me say, it is a neutral method and a neutral way of thinking. But exactly because of this a violence and aggression, it is not possible that Heidegger would have criticized Fichte for his idea of, of a 
cosmopolitical patriotism, or uh, it, it is not impossible that Heidegger would have criticized Fichte for his idea of a cosmopolitical patriotism. The violence of this universalism for Heidegger is the violence of worldlessness. Worldlessness is the destruction of the world, of what he calls being in the world. Worldlessness as constant calculating as technology destroys the historical shape of the place, its different idiomatic and idiotic character, its character of difference. At least in one phase of Heidegger's thinking, the worldlessness of universalism and the world of the place is an absolute alternative, an unstable relation where only one can survive and the other one is to be annihilated, where only one language can be spoken and the others have to vanish. In this sense, he once characterizes in this time also Plato's idea of the good, and is this not the idea at Ekanates Odias? It is not the, also Levinas' idea and Kassira's idea, the idea of a homogeneous space beyond all places. So, he characterizes this idea of the good, I quote, as the step actually going the farthest toward the standardized production of long-range fighter planes and toward the invention of radio communication technology. <coughs> he does this around 1939 in times where long-range fighter planes began to bomb Poland and Russia and before other fighter planes then destroyed German cities, also the old city of Freiburg. Jetzt komme Feuer. And wasn't it Norbert Wiener who explained cybernetics with the example of an anti-aircraft gun? There are other examples in Wiener, but two, but nevertheless this example is striking. No doubt, Heidegger would stress, if there is an absolute language, it would be the language of the long-range fighter planes. With this rupture or interruption of my presentation, something happened. Derrida's reflections on philosophical nationalism are getting a prolongation. I do not want to say a new dimension, because Derrida saw this threat of a phantom or of a phantasma, maybe of the phantasmagoric dimension of philosophy in general, i.e. of this threat of philosophy. But here one has to be very careful, for we actually cannot exactly know what this means, a phantasmagoric dimension of philosophy. Or we could only know this by presupposing a general criterion. Do we have such a criterion? If we do not want to call for a universal rationality for an absolute language, we do not have a presupposition for this judgment of how and why a philosophy or philosophical thought is phantasmagoric. But do we really not want to call for this absolute language? Do we know what we want? Or is philosophy something else than this knowledge? For Heidegger, around 1938-39, the worldlessness of technology is represented by Judaism. Levinas, in his critique of Heidegger, in Heidegger, Gagarin and Nous, is demanding for a homogeneous space of the human. Heidegger understands this worldlessness as an aggressive and destructive principle. Levinas thinks the same if he deals with Heidegger's emphasis of the place. A somehow irritating discussion because the implications of violence in place and in space as alternatives are barely to understand without a certain experience of this alternative, an experience Levinas and Heidegger made differently, to say the least. So philosophy is always personal because of experiences. In this being historical topography, for a certain time, the Jews were the agents, the agents or rep representatives of universal technology. In the context of my two quotations of the worldlessness of Judaism and the Platonic long-range fighter planes, the Jews were Platonists. Much to say about this, for instance, about Levinas, about Kashira also, but about other things. But this would be probably a, a wrong trace, because Heidegger dealt with Jew, Jewish monotheism as background for the totalitarian power of technology. Of course, Heidegger also had his problems with Christian monotheism, what cannot be understood without its Jewish origins. And now, how Derrida in the Schlecht III takes Heidegger's statements about the non-Christian character of Drakas' poetry, and how Derrida emphasized that the 13th session took place close to Easter and its promise of resurrection. 
And it is now questioned that the Germans, educated by Hodelinian hymns, represented the opposite of this technological universalism. Also in 1945, 46, in this evening conversation in a war camp in Russia, the Germans, as the waiting people who learned the unnecessary, the Germans are the people aware of the danger of technology overcoming, by the way, not only nationalism, but the difference between nationalism and internationalism as a figure of metaphysical thought. Maybe this text of the post-war time is the last one where Heidegger quite openly speaks about it being historical task of the Germans. Even if Heidegger in that painful passage of the self-annihilation of what is Jewish probably thought of what he later called um, fabrication of corpses in annihilation camps, the alternative of place and space did not, did not realize itself uh, in history. The Germans did not succeed nor in convincing the world that the Jews annihilated themselves in Auschwitz, nor, nor, nor did they themselves succeed in annihilating them. On the contrary, even if Israel is not real as the result of the Shoah, it is necessary to recall the Shoah to understand the self-interpretation of Eretz, Eretz Israel. <laughs> philosophically, <laughs> philosophically seen, Derrida is right when he writes, Je soupçonnais et soupçonne encore Heidegger de ne pas échapper à la formalité de ce schéma qu'on dit appel à penser la patrie depuis l'origine et l'horizon de l'histoire de l'être et du monde, et quand il place l'homme comme Dasein en ce lieu plus originaire que l'homme comme animal rational de l'humanisme métaphysique. With scheme, uh, Shema, scheme, Derrida thinks of the inverted patriotic uh, universalism or universal uh, patriotism of Fichte, except the teleology. Every thinker, poet, or whatsoever intellectual who claims the hegemony of his or her own collective community, nation, state, or nation state in general, for the world, for nature, for peace, for happiness, etc., must perform the Fichtean circle of a universal patriotism or patriotic universalism. Reduction of a plurality to a gathering unifying origin. He would have to perform what we are performing if we speak of the Greeks, because now we can say that this façon de parler is only the generally accepted harmless form of that <coughs> hegemony. But even if I can only confirm Derrida's, uh, be Derrida being correct with this, with, uh, with this remark, I want to stress that Heidegger's reduction of a plurality to the origin, to the absent origin, to absence, has in itself a destructive or even deconstructive element. And this is maybe something what Derrida was not aware um, enough. Uh, we spoke about that the day before, yesterday. For the reduction of Germanness to accents, to non-objectivity and to non-subjectivity, to nothingness in a sense, cannot produce any self-understanding different to this thought that being can never be beings. What polit political identity could come from this thought? Obviously, Heidegger wanted to gather people on being, on this nothingness. Did he know what he was doing? Can we not see here the beginning of a self-annihilation of Germanity? on the edge of a thinking beyond all principles, of an anarchic thinking. Alles, all is beginning. Alles ist Anfang, Heidegger sings in a manuscript of the end of the 30s. Derrida was maybe not aware of this negativity in Heidegger's thinking. I just want to give a short example of that, uh, so that you see that I don't, whatever, uh, Tell, tell a story or myth. I want to quote um, a, um, a passage from the end of, of the uh, Parmenides lecture course at the beginning of the 40s, where, where, we, where, where you see the whole project, the whole problem, and the whole project of Heidegger's uh, uh, national philosoph nationalisme philosophique allemand, allemand. He says there, but the highest form of pain is the dying of the death 
who is sacrificing the human being, Menschlein, for the conserving, for the Wahrung of the truth of being. This sacrifice is the purest experience of the voice of being. How then, if the very historical mansion tomb, which like the Greeks is called to dichten and denken, the Germans now, uh, how then, if this mansion tomb, the Germans, must hear at first the voice of being. Are these sacrifices not necessary, however by which causes they are realized immediately, because the sacrifice has its proper essence in itself and needs no purposes or goals and no use? So the thing is that, of course, it's problematic, highly problematic, this kind of discourse. There's no, 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 no question what, what, what he wants to do here is actually to, to tell to the, to the Germans that they have to sacrifice themselves for nothing. And this is definitely something else than Hitler's sacrifice, or that what Hitler would have called sac sacrifice. And, well, he didn't, definitely didn't succeed with his with this thoughts in political theory. Heidegger's being historical antisemitism, which implies this metaphysical scheme of reduction to an absent origin at the end of the 30s and at the beginning of the 40s, is, if we believe in Heidegger's words, not a racist one. He often distances his thinking from biology and natural science as such, and this distancing is principally trustworthy. Nevertheless, Heidegger could not, like, for instance, Ernst Jünger, Gottfried Benn, and, of course, Karl Schmidt, ignore the National Socialist emphasis of race. As an intellectual of this time, he accepted the political challenge to respond to this emphasis philosophically. And in his rare references to the assumed problems of race, he stresses that race cannot be an absolute condition, but it belongs to thrownness, to Geworfenheit, in the sense of a necessary but not sufficient condition of Dasein. He, uh, for instance, says that Rasse is das Eingeborene, the inborn. Um, in the strongest interpretation, one could say, because Dasein has a living body, a life, and by the way, therefore, a sex, for Heidegger at least, he or she belongs to, ra to a race. Thus, even if Heidegger does not accept a theoretical approach to race, he does not doubt a racial determination of the body. Place, then, is also race. Being born in a certain community at a certain place exposes to racial conditions. If we acknowledge that sexuality also is a moment of geworfenheit, of thrownness, we could think that race and sex are belonging together in this very context. But taken more precisely, that is a critique now of Heidegger, or would be a critique of Heidegger, we see that place, race, and sex are not referring to each other necessarily. If we understand thrownness as the absolute, absolute contingency of existence, Nobody is necessarily determined by place, race, or sex, even if we have to admit that this absolute contingency is the origin of facticity. Uh, just to explain that absolute contingency of thrownness means that every single signification of existence must be dif differentiated. And there is no necessary relation between being white, rich, male, and dumb. You can also be white and poor and smart. In this respect, Heidegger's re reduction of race to thrownness is, is at least ambivalent. If Heidegger refers to Jewish matrilinearity, he not only defends his, this own approach, his own approach, but the national socialist politics of race. If this is actually philosophically unnecessary and only to understand because Heidegger was loyal to Hitler and his revolution until the very bitter end, the reference to place and race, its defense, will find, even or particularly today, its supporters. Heidegger's errancy finds its limits in such simple dead ends. If we are friends with the philosophers, what is not always easy, because they are sometimes quite narcissistic megalomaniacs, then we could say that Fichte found a solution for the aporia of the relation between cosmopolitanism and patriotism. Cas cosmopolitanism and patriotism are not in radical difference, but in radical identity, he thinks. They are not excluding, but including each other mutually. And this solution is suspicious. How can Fichte claim this circle, this identity between cosmopolitanism and patriotism? Obviously, he sees a dialectical connection between them, 
Indeed, is cosmopolitanism characterized by the absence of implications of patriotism? Cosmopolitanism is not a praise of place and homeland. The absence of patriotism belongs to the essence of cosmopolitanism or universalism. This counts vice versa. Although we know that this dialectics has its problems, for it seems to operate on the level of mere concepts, we could think here the overcoming of Heidegger's and Levinas' extreme alternative. A world of place and homeland would need its own limit in a certain worldlessness as a space of philosophical reflection beyond the borders and boundaries of the place. A life in space would need its own limit as a world where we project our needs, our desire. Life is always factual, and facticity is always located. I say this only to respond to the dialectical scheme in the identity of cosmopolitanism and patriotism. I come to the end of the paper. Derrida's interpretations of Geschlecht III are in most of the sessions a close reading of Heidegger's reading of Trakel. In this close reading, Derrida often acts like a pathfinder, somebody who is finding. What he finds is that under the surface of an interpretation of poems or of a poet, Heidegger conceals certain intentions. One could call this Heidegger's own most subreption. But of course, <coughs> concerning the question of a German being historical task, Heidegger barely was hiding his thoughts. His discourse on the Geschlecht after World War II, after the Shoah, keeps contact to what Heidegger called around 938 the Hartes Geschlecht. Something what Derrida probably didn't know. Hartes Geschlecht, the Germans. In reference to a bad novel from 931 of the National Socialist writer Bill Vesper. Derrida was right to show that philosophizing in the dialectics of universalism and nationalism belongs to an old philosophical dream we can call metaphysics. If we use these terms, these elements, we will always come back to perspectives we can see in Le Geste Fichtien. Maybe we feel today how painful it is of not being able to leave this golden cage or cave or heaven. Everywhere and every time today we fall back into this cave, this heaven, when we try to leave it as if there would be no possibility to understand the problem of universalism and nationalism differently. Thus, for me, especially, one question remains. Derrida is one of the philosophers who understood that a mere moral or moralistic critique of Heidegger or of philosophy as such misses the purpose of its motivation, of the motivation of philosopher. If a philosopher has to be criticized or better deconstructed in the context of his or her own thoughts, his or her concealed or revealed presupposition. Presupposition. Derrida performs exactly this if he shows that Heidegger's philosophical nationalism uses the same scheme as the metaphysical philosophers. Heidegger actually wants to overcome. overcome. Donatella di Cesare in her book on Heidegger's metaphysical antisemitism is a Derridarian in this uh, respect. But could it be, and this is my not very important, but last question, but could it be that Derrida already falls prey to a Heideggerian move if he presupposes a difference between the history, history of being and metaphysics? Is Derrida not already using Heidegger's understanding of metaphysics if it helps him that he, Heidegger, got stuck in it? Is metaphysics, how we here use this term, not already? always already a Heideggerian metaphysics, we would have to ask again whether and how Heidegger has left the metaphysical dream of philosophy. And maybe he did this even in this thought, in this negativity I mentioned. And maybe uh, one missing philosopher in the, in the oeuvre of, of Derrida and in, in Heidegger's oeuvre could give us um, 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 a deeper understanding of this negativity, namely, I think, of Plotinus. Um, I know that uh, Derrida uh, spoke in Common and Pas Parler about, the, uh, about negative theology, but maybe he should have uh, paid more attention to, to Plotinus, also like Heidegger. Maybe this question is only one, another turn of those turns we know that it is one of the favorite figures of thought and philosophy. Turning thoughts around is what we do in dreaming in the in-between of heaven and cave. The threat for this dream appears as a nightmare or even a trauma. And Derrida may have been right 
that the origin of this nightmare or trauma can be said in one German word, Geschlecht. Thank you. Like to open the floor. Uh, I have two related questions. Uh, one about Fichte, you, ca you called it a paradox of um, identity of uh, universalism and patriotism. But it strongly reminds, can it, um, can it be seen as a repetition in a way of Jewish messianism, uh, one streams of it, well, the Israel being the light to the world, uh, and starting from Israel, uh, you know, it's well, very patriotic, but on the other hand, messianic. It's one question. And the second is, um, uh, and on this line from Fichte to Heidegger, uh, one can uh, oversee Karl Marx and his uh, criticism of Judentum. And it reminds me strongly of Heidegger's in Black Notes. Is it my superficial view or if there is a, because it's, I mean, the logic of criticism is, uh, seems, uh, you know what work of Marx I mean, of course. Yeah, that's... Uh, well, I didn't speak about Marx. Um, do I understand that correctly that you asked me whether uh, this Fichtian uh, figure of universal uh, patriotism or cosmopolitic patriotism, uh, that, that it could be the same to, to, to be found in Jewish messianism? Yeah, kind of, uh, not exactly the same, but repeating in a way, retrieving, you know, this idea. Because this idea itself, the, yeah. I, it's not n new, actually, and it, I, as far as I can tell, it comes first in Jewish, um, uh, well, how to say, uh, in Jewish mentality, I mean, in Jewish, well, yeah. <laughs> with Israel, you know, that, that's how, that was St. Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle, that was his... Actually, that's what he took uh, from, and uh, you know. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a Jewish messianism is, is, is probably a very important and interesting um, topic. And um, if you read, for instance, the text of Sholem about about uh, Jewish messianism in in in, uh, in in relation, for instance, to Christian eschatology, uh, it's, it's very it's highly, highly in, in, interesting, but I, I cannot say something about that because um, I, um, I don't see, uh, I, I, I don't see the, this, I, I don't see here the same or identical problem in it. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, in structure, in, maybe there are structural Similarities, but um, but I I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, go so far uh, to to speak about that or to to see their uh, identity here. And Marx to so Judenfrage about uh, question to do so, uh, that's that's um, that would be also another uh, another topic another uh, another discussion. Um, Um, I, of course, we there are all, there were there were, of course, you could read, for instance, Heidegger's being, in my view or my understanding, being historical antisemitism, with what Marx is doing in so Judenfrage. But uh, but that would be also very important then to have the text here and to see exactly and closely what Marx is doing, what Marx is saying, and what Heidegger is saying. So I would not go into this discussion here. Um, you're probably aware that uh, the Nazis had a uh, documentary um, called Dasein ohne Leben. And I've always wondered about the, that title, Dasein ohne Leben, because there, Dasein is seen as a kind of human rights. That, that film is, is, is about eugenics. It, it, it's about executing people who are, you know, mentally, have mental problems, physical problems. And they use that, that word Dasein really to represent the kind of universal condition of humanity and Leben 
is really used to talk about a meaningful German life in some, some sense. And I've, I've often wondered about whether anyone there was thinking, you know, about Heidegger, and also in general whether Dasein as a concept, it's, it's more abstract in, in, in a sense. Does, does it not also have certain kinds of cosmopolitan <clears throat> dimensions to it? In other words, you don't have to be... There, there, there are, there are uh, different um, yeah, different uh, times of, of Heidegger's thinking where he, where university, uh, uni yeah, also university, uh, universalism and um, absoluteness of science uh, were not, were, 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 uh, be they belonged to his own project at the end of the 20s more or less. For instance, this uh, quotation, uh, this problem of uh, Francois was referring to that that there is this uh, this ontic uh, dispersion of of Dasein in, in also into sexuality, and that there is a pure ontological uh, Dasein. Uh, this difference is is belongs to this to this context also. I, I by the way I always reminded me because he's dealing with Leibniz that here actually he is taking a Dasein as a monad, so he actually is. Explaining uh, Dasein on the on the level of that, what for what Leibniz is calling monad. So, and monad is also uh, for the for the monadology is very very complicated to say uh, and to explain how the monad, for instance, has has a metric even. So, how it has a body or something. And it's uh, for 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 Fichte, it's uh, yeah, for Leibniz not not so easy. It, it has, but uh, that's that's always uh, it's very very complicated for for. Yeah. For Leibniz to explain that. So, just to say that, but in this in this time, you could say that uh, he he was he was um, was trying uh, to 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 have a scientific uh, to to have a scientific position uh, on this level. But but this changed dramatically at the beginning of the 30s. I have time for one more question, Sam. Um, it's partly a comment and a question, but it was, I was very, uh, especially your, the way you were talking about the Greeks and the, the way we speak of the Greeks, we all speak of the Greeks, and then also this sort of the time in 1807 through 1810 and the Humboldt University and, and those writings, it, it just sort of reminded me of the fact that I don't think we really discussed over the last couple of days, that Derrida had worked through from 74 up to 84 on education very explicitly, mostly, almost all of it with reference to the French government and fights in teaching of philosophy, <coughs> then going through to the setting up of the Collège International, so, and engaging with those those German texts because they get translated in French in 1979. I mean, he's engaging with the German too, but people are reading them as well. So part of it was, I mean, in the the talk in your talk, I took it as a kind of a reminder if we're going to talk about Fichte. That that is one of one of the contexts to be thinking about this so-called philosophical name is a primarily educational context, and then so the question is, I, it made me think I hadn't really thought of this. When you read Derrida on that in '84, that maybe that first session or that, do you get the sense of Derrida having worked through all of that and sort of this is where he can arrive at where education now recedes? Um, I just that's a real question because I hadn't even thought of it that way, but it seems like. Maybe maybe it uh, must, well, but maybe not. I I I well, um, of course. I, for instance, university is some condition. Is is also a text in. Uh, I guess it's later. Huh? It's That's the later one. one. But the du Dual of philosophy is dealing with this context. Yes. Uh, uh, but what I what I think is that Derrida knew, and, and this is this is, I wanted to to remind us here that 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 Heidegger's discourse was was um, well without uh, with he. he, he he was not. It was for him. It was quite clear that this was his background. That this German, uh, yeah, very particular particular way of science. Uh, 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 how could you say that? Organized by philosophy. So that was in Heidegger's back. Without without that, he he he, he was not emphasizing that in the ways. So if if he deals with Fichte, he is dealing with other things. But but nevertheless, if if you understand. 
to Heidegger's <laughs> self-understanding, or if you want to understand Heidegger's self-understanding as, as a phil philosophy professor, uh, he has, he, he comes from, from this tradition. And that's what I want to, I want to remind us. And, and Derrida, I guess, quite clear that he that he knows that when he is referring to the Fichte gesture, to this Fichte gesture. So, um, so yeah, that that's that that I want to 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 emphasize. Let's thank Peter Jackson.